Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod and this is the Monday Night Review. Hello and welcome to episode 95 of the Monday Night Review. I hope you're all well and for those of you in the UK who celebrate it, you had a nice Mother's Day yesterday. I was spoilt. I was bought sunglasses and chocolate, which is basically the way to my heart. And I saw my mum and my sister and her family and we ate loads of sushi. And it was generally awesome. I went to a gig on Saturday night in London. I did a four hour round trip for one hour's worth of the Mighty Van Pelt and it was so good. I mean, they first album out in 25 years, but it's still, they still blew my mind. So that was a, a Saturday well spent. But I did think of you guys. I parked behind the garage in Highbury in North London. And as I got back to my car, I did a thorough check of the back seats as I'd actually not quite remember to shut my driver's side door properly. Um, but yeah, thought of you as I checked the back seat very carefully before I drove. So I hope you had an equally good weekend. I've been putting finishing touches to some new t-shirt designs that I have in the pipeline. And I'm sitting in my office having forgotten to put the radiator on. It is really cold. So I'm going to get straight into it. We've, uh, there are loads of sources for today's episode. I used an article by Denise No from truecrimelibrary.com, Wikipedia, Smithsonian Magazine, lots of things. Um, today we're going to talk about the tragic death of Virginia Rappé. Virginia Rappé was born in Chicago in 1895. Her mother, Mabel Rapp, died when she was 11 and Virginia was brought up by her grandmother. She would later add the E to the end of her name, thinking it sounded more refined. And when she was 18, she started work as a commercial and art model and in 1916 moved to San Francisco to pursue a career in modelling. Soon after, she met dress designer Robert Moskowitz and they became engaged, but he was killed in a streetcar accident before they could get married. And it's one of those moments in someone's life where you think, oh, I wonder what would have happened if that hadn't happened and they'd stayed together and got married because she doesn't seem to have very successful love life very happy love life. Rappé moved to Los Angeles where she was hired to star in several small films including one with the newly discovered Rudolph Valentino. In 1919 she began a relationship with director Henry Lerman who was already married but they moved in together and Rappé would appear in at least four of his films. Musical Sneeze, A Twilight Baby, Punch of the Irish and A Game Lady but her career never really took off and rumours circulated that she dabbled in sex work to pay her bills. There are two, definitely two sides to the Virginia Rappé story. Those who believe that she was sort of a film star whose career never took off and it was a bit sad and she dabbled in sex work. And those who think that what happened to her added a seedy side to someone who is actually incredibly talented and who was a, sort of not pursuing a film career, was a very successful model, had a very good eye for fashion and was a fashion designer at a time when fashion was not what, what the fashion industry is now. She was one of the first to really be admired for her style and things like that. In, and it would be in Los Angeles that Virginia met the man who would ultimately link, be linked to her untimely death, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Arbuckle was one of the most famous comedians of his time and one of the highest paid, having, at the time of this incident, just signed a $1 million deal with Paramount, which is the equivalent of about $16.8 million today, which probably isn't very notable in the world of Hollywood movies, but back then it was unheard of. Fatty Arbuckle was billed as, quote, worth his weight in laughs. He weighed around 266 pounds at this time, but and, and he had a reputation for partying and engaging in reckless behaviour. But he didn't use his size to get cheap laughs. 
He was remarkably agile, second only to Charlie Chaplin. And his pratfalls, pie throwing and somersaults wowed audiences. Interestingly, Rapé was occasionally interviewed by newspapers and movie magazines. And in one of these interviews, she discussed a meeting with Roscoe Arbuckle. She called him disgusting and crude, vulgar and disrespectful of women. Now, this was probably down to him having a feud with Lerman at the time, and it did not fit at all with what other actresses said about Arbuckle. And I think that's quite an interesting point to remember, is that by all accounts, women found Arbuckle to be a dapper and polite gentleman. He is married a few times. There is no mention of him being violent towards women. Quite the opposite. He doesn't consummate his marriage with his first wife for about a week because he felt there was such pressure um, about it. And so they would cuddle at night instead. So although he gets a reputation for drinking, which we'll talk about later, there is never any reputation for violence. Now, of course, many a bad man has been seen as charming by many. But from what I can see, Arbuckle seems to be yeah unpleasant when drunk, but there's no evidence of him being violent or a sexual predator. He was born on the 24th of March, 1887 in South Centre, Kansas. Arbuckle was a big boy from birth, weighing between 14 and 16 pounds. I cannot imagine. He had eight siblings and the family moved to California when he was small. Their father, William Goodrich Arbuckle, was a hard drinking man who blamed the large Roscoe for his mother's health problems and secretly believed the child wasn't even his. Both parents were slender and the other children were small too. So this hefter didn't really fit in. The Arbuckles were devout and pious Christians and with eight other kids to look after and no evidence of an affair, it seems unlikely that Mrs Arbuckle was knocking around with other men. But Roscoe would always feel this exclusion from his father. Teased for being large and nicknamed Fatty by other children, Arbuckle was shy and withdrawn and then used food to deal with it, getting into a cycle of eating because he was miserable and then the teasing continuing. But he soon found out that he had an agility and humour that entertained. He could make people laugh and his shyness vanished when he performed. Making his stage debut at the age of eight, he basically worked quite continuously as a clown, a singer, he had a beautiful singing voice, and an acrobat. At the age of 12, his mother died and his father, who had been physically and mentally abusive, uh, didn't disown him, but basically he was sent on a train journey to live with his father and his father never came to pick him up. So Arbuckle, Arbuckle kept himself afloat doing odd jobs and whilst working he would sing to himself and one day he was overheard by a performer who suggested he go to an amateur night that they were holding at a local theatre. And it was sort of a talent night where a giant hook would come out of the wings and take the performer off the stage if their act wasn't going well. And this terrified Arbuckle, who became kind of fixated on it. And he sang a few songs and entertained the audience. And when the hook inevitably came out, he sort of jumped and somersaulted out of its way, eventually diving into the orchestra pit with the audience cheering and clapping. He won the the show that night and had been noticed by some big deal theatre people who had been in the audience and he began touring with various theatre companies in 1906. Neat and fastidious, Arbuckle hated swearing and his friends called him Roscoe, not Fatty, and if they called him Fatty, as he was known in the pictures, he would politely correct them and say it's Roscoe. In 1909, he married Minta Duffrey, and as I say, they didn't consummate the marriage for the first week because he apologised and said, I just feel like the pressure's too much. He had lost his virginity to a showgirl before, but that was it as far as we know for his sexual relationships. And so they cuddled for a week until he felt comfortable. And she travelled with him. They travelled through China with a theatre company. 
And Minta would there see a side to her husband husband that she wasn't too keen on. Like his father before him, Booz would transform our buckle and during this tour he would often go out drinking with the boys and he would become sullen, mean and belligerent, but never violent. On returning to America in 1913, he was often to be seen as one of the Keystone Cops and he had this auspicious title of being the very first actor in films to take a pie in the face when he made a noise from the deep and had the very rare talent of being able to toss two pies in opposite directions, a big deal during silent movie times. In 1914, he started directing some of his pictures and at the time, a carbuncle on his leg got so bad that he nearly had to have the leg amputated and at, as recovering from this he was given morphine and he did struggle with a brief addiction to morphine which he seems to have got control of in 1917 Arbuckle hired a young actor and fellow Kansan Buster Keaton to star with him in a film The Butcher Boy and it was the start of a friendship and working relationship with that would continue for the rest of Arbuckle's life but 1917 also saw the separation of Arbuckle and Minter when he wouldn't stop his drinking. And interestingly, everyone said that Arbuckle had never cheated on his wife, with one friend saying, quote, Arbuckle may have been the most chaste man in Hollywood. Now, usually when a scandal drops, stories will come out of the woodwork. When you hear in Hollywood about a couple breaking up or domestic abuse or a divorce, quite often it will then be that the PAs come forward, the people who've worked for them have come forward and will say, this is what I had to do, this is what they did, you know, this was the behind the scenes, they were violent or whatever. There seems to be none of that with Arbuckle. No one seems, you know, he seems to be not particularly pleasant when he's drinking. There's no sign of any kind of sexual deviance sexual assault uh pursuing women no violence towards women and in 1919 he was making up to six motion pictures a year some good 1920s Brewster's Millions and 1921's A Gasoline Gus and others not so great because he was just working flat out. At one point he was working on three movies at the same time. He was completely exhausted and decided to take a three day holiday in San Francisco with his friend director Fred Fishback. Before they left however he got this really horrible injury. Now most accounts go with the one I'm leaning towards some say that he backed into a stove but most accounts hold that he was at a mechanics getting his beloved car fixed and he sat down on an acid soaked rag the acid soaked through his trousers leaving him with second degree burns on his buttocks he was in a lot of pain he tried to back out of the planned trip but fishback wouldn't hear of it quite he was quite angry that Arbuckle would try and back out and he said you know it'd be worth the long drive he had connections in San Francisco to hook them up with bootleg booze prohibition in America had started in 1920 and eventually they found Arbuckle a rubber ring to sit on while he drove and off they went they arrived at the St Francis Hotel and rented three adjoining rooms numbers 1219 1220 and 1221. 1219 was Fishbats and Arbuckle's room. 1220 was the party room. And 1221 was a friend, an acting friend of theirs room. And Arbuckle was looking forward to a much needed relaxing weekend. What happened next has been misremembered, exaggerated, falsely reported on so many times that it's difficult to know the truth. What we do know is that on the 5th of September 1921, 33-year-old Arbuckle was throwing a party in his hotel suite or attending a party in his hotel suite. Alcohol was in abundance. 
And 26-year-old Virginia Rappé was in attendance. They had met each other on and off during the film circuit. They weren't particularly friends. At some point, Virginia became ill and three days later was rushed to hospital. And she died on the 9th of September from a ruptured bladder. And rumours began to circulate that Arbuckle had been responsible for her death. So those are the facts. There was a party. Virginia Rappé gets ill and dies as a result. We're going to dig a little deeper. I think I know... I, I think I know what happened, but it, it's, a, it's a contentious issue. <laughs> there are so many differing accounts, and there seem to be people who are pro Arbuckle and some that are pro Rappé. The pro Arbuckle side say that during the party, witnesses recalled an intoxicated Rappé complaining she could not breathe and then starting to tear her clothes off. And this was not the first incident of Virginia Rappé stripping while drunk. One newspaper even dubbed her an amateur call girl who used to get drunk at parties and start to tear her clothes off. Some link this behaviour to bladder complaints that used to be exacerbated by alcohol and she would take her clothes off to alleviate the pain. Now, the bladder complaint thing goes up and down. People say that she suffered with cystitis a lot. That could also be linked to the alleged venereal disease that she supposedly suffered from. That there nothing seems clear. Rappé had gone to the party with her friend Maud Delmont. According to Delmont, after a few drinks, Arbuckle strong-armed Rappé into his room with the sinister utterance, I've waited for you for five years and now I've got you. After 30 minutes or so, Delmont became concerned upon hearing screams from behind the closed door of Arbuckle's room and started knocking. Arbuckle answered the door, wearing, quote, his foolish screen smile, and Virginia Rappé was on the bed, naked and moaning in pain. Delmont claims that Rappé managed to gasp Arbuckle did it before she was taken away into a different hotel room. Rappé was tended to by the hotel doctor who dosed her with morphine. He knew Delmont, I don't, we don't know how, and she told him that Rappé was struggling as the result of being raped by Arbuckle. The doctor found no evidence of violence or rape, though in 1920s, there's, I, I don't know how much uh, checking they will have done, but also obviously rape doesn't always leave evidence uh it's mm, it's hard to know what to make of that she was in pain she was having trouble peeing and this didn't improve after three days so she was taken to hospital now it was thought that she was suffering from poisoning from bootleg booze but in fact she had peritonitis and a ruptured bladder, and died on the 9th of September 1921. The cause for the ruptured bladder is a matter of great debate. At the hospital, Delmont told the police that Rappé had been raped by Arbuckle, and when the press got hold of the story, it went absolutely wild. Arbuckle turned himself in immediately. Authorities would allege that Rappé's bladder ruptured from the overweight comedian sexually assaulting her. Rumours also swirled that he had, sorry about this, raped her with an instrument like a Coca-Cola bottle or a champagne bottle. However, these rumours are completely false. No such attack was even alleged in court. There was no evidence for this. It was just the rumour mill getting more out of hand. It is interesting, though, because your bladder, your bladder doesn't rupture on its own as a result of peritonitis or anything like that it has to have force so that's a matter for debate immediately Arbuckle's latest movie was pulled from the cinemas and tales of his alleged sexual depravity started to swirl with no proof literally it was just a case of the media and gossip no one came forward to say this has happened, or he's, you know, I was at a party when this happened. No one who'd actually knew him or met him said anything about his sexual depravity. 
A mugshot showing the dejected actor in a suit and tie was released and he initially refused to comment, but the story wasn't going anywhere, so he was advised by his lawyer to give a statement. In his statement, he says he was exhausted. The party had been organised by Fishback. Everything from the place, the hotel, the booze, the guest list. He was concerned that... he was actually Arbuckle was actually concerned that... Delmont and Rappé were present when he walked into the room in his pyjamas and slippers went and found the party already in full swing. Delmont was known for procuring girls for Hollywood parties and then blackmailing the celebrities that they slept with. And Rappé was a young actress who liked to party. And he was just not from what I can, from the picture I gather of Fatty Arbuckle, and there will be people that know a lot more than me, he seems to be one of those men who drinks with the boys, gets mean, gets belligerent, but doesn't really have that confidence with women. It doesn't sort of drink and become lecherous like some men do, or doesn't feel like, oh, now I'm drunk with the boys, we've got to go and get some women. He that doesn't seem to be part of his thing. And I can imagine if that is the case, then having someone who's known for like getting quite pissed up, taking her clothes off and that kind of thing is just not what he's up for. If it's a relaxing weekend, I could be wrong. At around 3 p.m. Arbuckle says he um, had agreed to give an actress friend of his a lift to the station. So he went into his room to go and get changed Whilst he was in his room, he went into the adjoining bathroom and found Rappé lying on the bathroom floor next to the loo. She'd been sick in the loo and he, she had taken some of her clothes off. So he helped her be sick and then carried her and put her on the bed. Now, he says that Buster Keaton had told him that if you held ice against someone's thigh, you could tell if they were kind of faking illness or they were just a bit too drunk. And so he held a piece of ice on her thigh and this had no response for for Rappé. She didn't snap out of it. This would go on to be um, changed that he was holding ice cubes on her vulva. Again, this did not happen. No evidence of that. So he calls a friend in. The bathtub had been filled with water, obviously, to keep the booze cool. And they put Virginia in the tub. She seems to be in pain. But again, if you're really pissed and you've been sick, you generally feel rubbish. So they put her in the tub. This seems to calm her down a bit. And then fish back in our buckle, help her out the bath and escort her to room 1227. Delmont goes into the room with them. Arbuckle then says he phoned the hotel manager and tried to get the hotel doctor who wasn't there. So Dr. Olav Carbo came to the room to take a look at Virginia. Again, his diagnosis was that she was just drunk. And Rappé had a history of sort of drinking too much, not holding her drink that well, taking her clothes off. Bootleg booze, not that great quality can have stuff in it um it's also worth noting that Arbuckle was about to drive he didn't appear drunk to anyone he was drinking a bit but he wasn't pissed journalist Adela Rogers St John said quote the first day after Fatty had been indicted the man who did my cleaning came to me and told me I did Virginia Rappe's cleaning I see where one side shows she was a sweet young girl and Mr. Arbuckle dragged her into a bedroom. Well, once I went into her house to hang up some cleaning and the first thing I knew, she'd torn off her dress and was running outdoors yelling, save me, a man attacked me. The neighbours told me whenever she got a few drinks into her, she did that. The subsequent trial was one of the most sensational and highly publicised of its time. Arbuckle was charged with manslaughter for, and his trial set for November. Despite their separation, Minta regularly visited her husband in prison. Eventually, uh, she, I think on her first visit, asked him if he was guilty and he replied, 
Minty, I swear to God, I never touched that girl like they say I did. That was good enough for Minta. She visited him regularly. She appeared in the courtroom every day to show her support for him. She, she knows him better than anyone else. But then again, many a wife has been deceived, I suppose. The prosecution's first witness was a nurse named Grace Halston, who was obviously convinced that Arbuckle was guilty. And she testified that the late Rappé had several bruises on her body and that her organs were torn in a way that suggested force. The the defence got Halston to admit later that the ruptured bladder could have been caused by cancer and that bruises might have been caused by Rappé's heavy jewellery. Or I'm guessing what we would call pub bruises which is basically you get pissed, you wake up the next day, you have bruises, no idea where they came from. Dr. Arthur Beardsley testified that the bladder seemed to be injured from force inflicted from outside her body. On cross-examination, he admitted that Rappé had said nothing to him, indicating she'd been assaulted by the accused. He, I believe he's the um, person who performed the autopsy. and. He's the person who looked after her in the hotel before she was taken to hospital. And she was conscious on and off. He was giving her morphine, but she was conscious. She could have said to him what had happened. She never mentioned it. The only person who does really push it is Maud Delmont. He also says... um, that the sick woman would have benefited from surgery... And he was then asked why he hadn't performed surgery and he had no response to this. So it would seem that if she had been taken straight to hospital and they had narrowed down to where the pain was coming from and had um, performed surgery, they could have fixed the ruptured bladder. I don't think the ruptured bladder caused peritonitis. Again, we'll get into that later, but it could really have helped her. It also became apparent that the prosecution team had attempted to intimidate witnesses, including party attendees Alice Blake and Zay Prevon. Prevon was called to the stand and testified that she'd signed the statement saying Rappé had claimed he killed me under duress. Alice Blake made similar assertions from the witness stand. The defence team also pointed out that there was no sign of a key player to the whole event on the witness stand. Where was Maud Delmont? Maud Delmont was never called as a witness. She was so incredibly unreliable. Every time she'd been interviewed by a San Francisco district attorney, Matthew Brady, her story had changed. She maintained that she was best friends with Rappé, though evidence suggests that they had actually only met a few days before the party. She had been charged. She had previously been charged with extortion, bigamy, fraud and racketeering. Author Andy Edmonds describes Delmont as, quote, a professional correspondent, a woman hired to provide compromising pictures to use in divorce cases or for more unscrupulous purposes such as blackmail. She'd also written a telegram to a lawyer saying we've got a chance to make some big money out of our buckle. Uh, This is our chance to make some big money out of our buckle. So she sent this after... Rappé was taken ill and it seems that you know she's already thinking she can cash in on this so she never gets called to court she she can't she's nothing she says can be trusted but the court does hear from Dr Edward Heinrich criminologist who is an expert in fingerprints he testified that partial prints of Rappé were found on the inside of the door to 1219 which was Arbuckle's bedroom and Arbuckle's prints were superimposed over them and this would indicate that the two had struggled over the door with the implication being that the actress tried to open it while the comedian slammed it shut however the defense called ignatius mccarthy to the stand i love i quite like ignatius as a name mccarthy had been a federal investigator and he said that he could prove that the fingerprints were faked McNabb also called to the stand a hotel maid who claimed that she had dusted the door several times before it was sealed and examined by the district attorney. Interestingly, in the second trial, because this would be heard three times, Dr. Heinrich would admit that he believed the overlapping fingerprints on the bedroom door may well have actually been faked. 
Arbuckle would be on the stand for four hours, smartly dressed, somber and visibly exhausted. He stuck to his story and seemed unruffled when pressed. Many believed and the defence claimed that this was a deliberate plan by Delmont and others to cause the fall of Fatty Arbuckle. An expert witness was called to, the, to talk about the extent of Rappe's injuries. Andy Edmonds says the experts agreed on four points, that the bladder was ruptured, that there was evidence of chronic inflammation, that there were signs of acute peritonitis, and that the examination failed to reveal any pathological change in the vicinity of the tear preceding the rupture. In short, the rupture was not caused by external force. But bladders don't rupture on their own. Now, a few things have been noted. Rappé had a smaller bladder than usual caused by some sort of bladder disease. Now, whether this was, as many say, just continuous UTIs um, or continuous infections that aren't treated properly um, or some other disease, there's never any definite... Virginia Rappe had this disease of her bladder. Nothing ever comes forward like that. Even the nurse says, you know, the rupture could have been caused by cancer. There's no evidence that she had bladder cancer. So the first two trials end with a hung jury and the third find Fatty Arbuckle innocent with the jury giving the unprecedented statement of apology. Quote, acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel that great injustice has been done to him. There was not the slightest proof adducted to connect him to, in any way with the commission of a crime. We wish him success and hope that the American people will take the judgment of 14 men and women who have sat listening for 31 days to evidence that Roscoe Arbuckle is entirely innocent and free from all blame. But Roscoe Arbuckle's career was ruined. The trial had cost him over $700,000. And he was blacklisted from the film industry with Will Hayes hired by the motion picture industry to restore its image, banning Arbuckle from appearing on screen. Though Hayes would change his mind, eight months later, the damage was done. But what really happened that night? The truth may never be known. Some believe that Virginia's death was the result of a botched abortion or pre-existing medical condition. I've read bladder disease could explain the ruptured organ. Others have said continuous cystitis, which I don't think would. Venereal disease is something that comes up a lot, um, which could make sense for the peritonitis if it was secondary peritonitis and the bacteria had somehow travelled into the body. And then the vomiting could rupture the already damaged bladder. Others maintain that Arbuckle was responsible for her death, either by literally just weighing down on her um, and there's this weird story that everyone knew that Roscoe was ticklish and that when he was tickled, he would double over and lift his leg up. And Rappé didn't know, she knew he was ticklish, she didn't know about the leg thing and that she tickled Arbuckle and he bent over and lifted his leg up and accidentally kneed her. And that was when she was then in loads of pain and that would explain for her allegedly saying, why has he done this to me? Meaning, why did he kick me? But I would have thought that if this had been the case, then all of Arbuckle's friends would have come forward and said, no, 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 we were there. He accidentally need her. She tickled him. He need her. That could have caused the problem. He himself was, is on the stand for four hours. This He doesn't say anything about this story. He sticks to his story. He found her in the bathroom vomiting. He carries her to the bed. He goes to get dressed. She falls off the bed. You know, that he doesn't change from that story. So some believe that, you know, poor Roscoe Arbuckle has been hard done by. Some believe that he has got away with murder. After he is acquitted, he's depressed and he starts drinking too much. He would return to the stage and was well received by those who loved him and he seemed to g get new fans, but it was obviously a big change from being the highest paid actor in Hollywood. 
He was able to obtain work behind the camera as a director working under the pseudonym William B. Goodrich. His second marriage in 1925 to Doris Dean only lasted three years with Arbuckle's drinking once again causing problems. Arbuckle returned to the screen for buzzing around, proving that he still had this special gift for light-hearted slapstick and audiences flocked to see it. And I think it was a bit like, okay, this is the start of building it back up again. In June 1932, he married Addie McPhail and they were happy. Arbuckle was offered a film contract by Warner Brothers, which he accepted. And in June 1933, he signed this contract. He went out for dinner with Addie to celebrate their one year anniversary and the contract signing. And he had said to one of his friends that day, this is the happiest day of my life. That night, 46 year old Roscoe Arbuckle died in his sleep from heart disease. Regardless of what happened, and I've heard podcasts who think Arbuckle is a cruel rapist who got away with murder, and others who believe he was the unfortunate target of a vindictive plan to topple him off Hollywood's hotspot. Virginia Rappé's story is a really tragic one. She was a talented and ambitious young woman who dreamed of making it big in Hollywood. We've all probably have friends who are a bit messy when they drink. Uh, so she's not alone in that. She's very young to die. So it would have been lovely to know what would have happened if she'd got a bit of a hold on that, perhaps, when she was older. And yeah, she dreamed of making it big in Hollywood. And by all accounts, her fashion, you know, her style and her fashion were really uh, something to note that she could have gone further with. But instead, she became the centre of a scandal that would ultimately destroy her own life, as well as the career of one of the most popular comedians of his time. And that is the tragic death of Virginia Rappé. I'd love to know what you think on this one. I went into it being very much that Arbuckle was guilty. And the more I dug down, the more I thought, there's just no evidence of any behaviours of his leading up to this, no sort of even interest in women, uh, apart from the women he married, obviously, but there's no lecture, there's no violence. And of course, that doesn't mean that he couldn't change or it couldn't manifest itself. But to me, it seems that if you take Maud Delmont out of the equation, uh, as it was her that was telling everyone that Rappé had been raped. And by all accounts, Delmont was sleeping with Fishback at the party and was wearing his pyjamas and actually wasn't that focused on Rappé. Um, I, I believe that perhaps she just saw an opportunity and went for it. I, that's what I believe. I'd love to know what you think. I feel so incredibly sorry for Rappé because it sounds just awful. Uh, a really distressing end. So let me know. Let me know what you think. You, if you're on Patreon, you can start a chat thread, which I would love because then I can see what you're saying. I love a good old discussion. Uh, you can send me messages, you can send me emails, you can find me at themondaynightreview at gmail.com or at the Monday Night Review on Facebook, on TikTok, on Instagram. And until next week, be kind, stay safe and always check the back seats before you drive.